everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're so glad you've joined us today. Again, CER is celebrating uh, 30th anniversary of National Charter School Week. Uh, we have assembled uh, panels of established educators, school leaders, and we're bringing them on today to share their experiences and their work surrounding charter schools. Uh, the purpose of this panel specifically is to share some success stories, uh, some best practices about returning students to open schoolhouses during COVID-19 times. Um, and the first, uh, first panelist we'd like to introduce is Michelle Ashton. Uh, Ms. Ashton is the CEO and founder of Digital Pioneers Academy. Uh, she started as a special education teacher at Ann Beers Elementary here in Washington, D.C. Little shout out to my hometown. Uh, she served as an entrepreneur uh, in residence at the City Bridge Foundation and Education Forward in Washington, D.C. Uh, she was also the CEO of the Newark Charter School Fund. Uh, she oversaw a $40 million initiative to support the quality growth of charter schools. And as the executive director for charter schools for the New York City Department of Education and the national director of recruitment and selection for KIPP. Uh, Ms. Ashton, take it away, please. Hey, Michael, how's it going today? And hello to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, as you said, this is an incredibly, incredibly tough time. I mean, I can talk about how to stay remote and I can also talk about how to get back in person um, because in the last two weeks, we had over 40 of our scholars return back to school um, having been you know, remote for the last over a year. Um, this is an incredibly tough time to be a school leader. If someone had asked me to be a school leader four years ago and I had known it was gonna be a pandemic, I would have ran clearly the other direction. Um, but now that we are here, um, I, I, you know, constantly having to reflect. I think the number one thing that I would say is you definitely have to listen to your parents and to your teachers and to your team and find ways to bring them along um, with every decision that you make. Um, that's my big lesson as a leader. Um, I think the second lesson I have, um, having been in the charter school space, having been in public school space and been in the parent choice space for the last 20 plus years, is that we have gotta be even more innovative than we ever have to be, um, particularly now in multiple pandemics. And for us at Digital Pioneers Academy, we believe that uh, our kids studying computer science, um, knowing having the technology skills is a requirement. It, cannot, it can no longer be an option for our, our scholars and our families, not just in DC, but across the country. Um, I don't know how long I'm supposed to go on, Michael, so you're gonna have to cut me off. Um, I would say that, you know, the way, the success that we have had is because we are a school that focuses on innovation, focuses on being college prep, computer science for all and committed to all kids. In this pandemic, we have, and I'm looking at my attendance right here, we have a 94% average attendance every single day. This is scholars attending three hours plus of live Zoom lessons with their teachers. We have we were able to transition to 100% online within two weeks of the pandemic. Our scholars knew how to log in, our teachers knew how to teach. And I'm saying this, it hasn't been easy, but it was much smoother than a lot of other schools that I know across the city and across the country. Uh, and the last thing I will say in terms of coming back in person, um, parents want to come back and we've got to find ways to get them back. But the number one thing has to be safety, 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 everyone wearing a mask, everyone social distancing and the whole community working together and it can be done. Yeah, and, and, and thank you, Michelle, and, and you're exactly right. I, it, it can't be just a return of, oh, everybody's back in the buildings now, let's go back to the way it was. And, and, and with that, I want to bring in Joanne Mitchell next. Uh, Joanne, uh, you started schools in New York. You also started a phenomenal school when you moved to Albuquerque out in New Mexico, uh, Mission Achievement and Success Charter School. Uh, you have been a dynamic and innovative charter leader, and you're not afraid to get your hands dirty and fight the fight when it's needed. 
Uh, can you talk a little bit about your approaches? <laughs> okay, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be able to be on here and to uh, share our experiences. So we, um, we, I mean, we listened to the demands of our families and the minute we were allowed to come back in person. So we were able to, in our state in New Mexico, the earliest we were allowed to come back was September 8th. And that was only grades K through six. And, um, you know, many, many schools, you know, opted to not do it for a host of reasons, whether it was just couldn't meet the demands of the, um, the, the reentry criteria or whatever else it was. But we had, when we surveyed our parents, so we, we are a pre-K through 12 charter and we have two campuses and we serve right now just under 2000 students. And um, so when we um, surveyed our families, you know, over 80% wanted to come back. We were only allowed to bring back K through six. We brought every K through six family that wanted to come back in September. So we were an early pioneer in the state because a lot of folks opted to just to not do it. And again, host of reasons why. And I can tell you there were challenges with it, but I, I felt like, you know, if we really were truly responsive to what families wanted, they wanted to be back for a myriad of reasons. And so we did it. And I, I think that, you know, I think the, the proof is in the result of how students are performing as well, because we've been able to be very innovative, responsive. I, I think that having a strong school culture and like phenomenal staff who were really adaptive and flexible and responsive to whatever we needed. We had to constantly make shifts because the criteria for reentry, different things were continually changing. So quite honestly, it would have been easier to not do it because you know? early on, you know, you started and then you had to change and then you started doing this. And I mean, and then you had to go start spray painting X's in the parking lot, like, you know, where kids get picked up so you can keep them six feet apart because to try to tell kids stay six feet, it's not really a strong concept, you know what I mean? Of like, how do you, how do you do that? So there were a lot of things we had to really think through plans in order to make sure that it worked because it wasn't going to be effective if we brought them back, but we had to shut down because it just wasn't working or we were in trouble for different things, you know? So we, you know, again, I, I can't emphasize enough how I think having folks who are so committed to this work, so driven by the mission of what we do, that we're willing to do the extra work. Because what we had to do too is, you know, we learned early on that once we came back doing hybrid and having some kids home and some kids in person, but not having two separate staff, you have to get a little creative. You know, we hadn't taught like that before, right? So constant changes. And, I, you know, reminding staff all the time that, you know, your commitment and your work is the second to none, you know, to be able to navigate these changes, it just speaks volumes about the commitment. So, you know, those have been some of our early successes. The moment we have been able to allow more students, once they lifted restrictions and said, now you can bring back middle school, now you can bring back high school, we did it. I mean, we were responsive within the week of being able to make those things happen because we felt so strongly about allowing that opportunity for in-person, especially knowing that over 80% of our parents were asking for that. That's great, thank you. That's exactly what uh, the type of information that we were looking for. Uh, our, our final panelist for this panel, which is entitled Against All Odds, Brick and Mortar Schools Open for Learning, is uh, Sherlon <coughs> Clay. Ms. Clay is the Director of Academics, uh, uh, GEO or GEO Prep Academy of Greater Baton Rouge. Uh, she's been a teacher. She's been a master teacher or principal. She won Teacher of the Year Award as a teacher and she leads Geo Prep Academy's academic team. Um, Ms. Clay, can you talk a little about, Sherlon, can you talk a little bit about what's going on with Geo Academies and Baton Rouge and all that's going on uh, throughout the country? Because we know Geo Academies is uh, in, in many different places. Yes, yes, thank you, Michael. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to sit amongst you guys to discuss our experiences with the pandemic and how we reopen. Uh, we are a traditional school. Brick and mortar was all we knew uh, until about a year and a half ago. We had to go virtual. Uh, so immediately we had to come up with a plan of action and we had to do it quickly. So we immediately surveyed all of our parents, more so to see if they had internet access. We distributed hotspots, Chromebook, and curriculum material. Most importantly, coming from the brick and mortar setting, our teachers had no experiences teaching virtually, so we had to provide some professional development and do it quickly. We were able to begin virtual teaching 
uh, within a week of being uh, put out the building. Uh, this was a very, very difficult time for not only the teachers, the students, but more so the families. We still had families that needed to work. Uh, the kids were being left at home with grandparents who were not able to log in. Uh, even for the lower grades, we had to be very, very creative with how we, how we will provide the virtual learning. So our teachers went through several trainings on Nearpod, making it very interactive. As we progressed through the summer, uh, we still provided a summer school, but it was done virtually. Uh, all our summer PDs for our teachers were done virtually, not knowing what our new school year would entail, uh, but we had to get them prepared. So in August, we opened up school 100% virtual. Uh, at the Labor Day, we were able to transition at least 25% of our scholars back face-to-face. We were very intentional on how we selected those scholars to enter the building. We immediately uh, looked at our students that received special services, the students that had lack of attendance, uh, those students that were just trickling, that was falling behind, had first priority to coming back into the building. Because once we surveyed the families, everybody was ready to come back into the building. Uh, some challenges that we faced during this time, our teachers had to teach both virtually and face-to-face. -face. Limited breaks, very few transition times, because again, we had to adhere to the CDC guidelines. But we knew we needed to get back in the building for those scholars who were falling behind. Uh, that, which brings us up to now, we have at least 80% of our scholars back into the building. Thank God we're back into phase three. Uh, so now it's creating a plan of moving forward. Uh, we know that we are going to experience gaps, a lot of lost, lost gaps with our scholars. So whereas our normal summer school would be like a summer enrichment, but now it's summer school. We're looking at prerequisite skills uh, that we need to uh, push out for those scholars and those modules for the upcoming school year. Um, we need to kind of teach those now in the summertime because of the gaps that we lost during the pandemic. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but again, we did the best that we could. Uh, we still wanted to make it seem uh, as much as like school, like it, like it should have been. Yeah, well, 80% is great. I mean, you know, you yes. think about some places are coming back and they're only back two days a week and it's only for three hours a day and it's less than 35% of the city's, you know, children and, and those mostly who've lost enormous amounts of academic time. And they try to say, oh, we're back to school. And that, and that somehow qualifies back to school. Uh, I want to bring back Jeannie Allen again uh, for the Q and a period, because I think we're going to have some great Q and a Jeannie, welcome back. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everybody. I've really enjoyed listening um, to your discussion. Michelle, let me go ahead and start with you. And, you know, you've been involved with chartering and charter school movement and education uh, advocacy for opportunity for a long time um, before starting Digital Pioneers. Um, you all have had incredible uh, experiences. And so I'd love you all to answer this. But like, let's just be bare and frank. Would you have loved to be, I mean, a lot of you had to depend largely on your cities and what your cities were doing. Then you're also watching the brick and mortar, you know, other traditional public schools complain and have challenges, some legitimate, some not. We're watching the CDC union thing unfold. D do you just kind of wish you've been able to do this all by yourself and not have to pay it? Like, could you have done this better if you were solely in control and didn't have to worry about any other systems? You know, to be honest, I'm going to be really honest, Please. Jeannie. Um, the, the thing about this, like we as charter folks have to be relentless in fighting for our autonomy, period, end of story, specifically when it comes to serving our, the students and families who are in our buildings. And I will tell you, I was never prepared to be a leader in covid I don't like, I know too much about trophers right now, too much about vaccinations and all those things. So that is not something in the last 25 years I ever thought I was gonna be an expert on. So for me, I, I don't think I could have led without support and clarity um, from the city. 
Um, I think the city had to lead. And I think in DC, I think the city has led pretty well when it comes to health safety guidelines of everyone. I don't think there's a way to just say, leave me alone. Um, and that I, we couldn't do that because our families are in multiple schools. Our kids live in multiple jurisdictions. It all impacted one another. I do think that keeping the autonomy clear could be better. And so then the question is, well, where do we need to be consistent? Where do we need to be the same for the health and safety of a whole city, a whole school community? I wish that that is where the conversation started and would continue. And, you know, the reality is that there are a number of things that we have learned and I've been able to do because I'm a charter school. So I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to take that away. Uh, where some of my traditional public school friends um, have not been, e been able to have the autonomy to be able to really serve their, I mean, a perfect example is uh, we, we had Chromebooks, but our Chromebooks were too small. I couldn't imagine our kids being on small Chromebooks for a year. <laughs> so we just bought all new 15 inch screen Chromebooks so that our kids wouldn't be squinching all the time. Right. I know a traditional public school principal would have loved to have done that and would not have been able to do that. So I would say, give all schools the autonomy around how they're going to spend their money during this time, but make the standards around safety and opening the same and now and now get out the way. Such a great point. It's that it's that idea of the backpack, right? Give everyone the same amount of money, the devices, by the way, the internet, the internet. and then say, right? And then say, okay figure out how you're going to do it under the health and safety. I think that's incredibly um, thoughtful. Shalon, when you were, you know, looking at what was happening in your community, um, one of the things that struck me as we watched um, is that every street, every school was being treated the same. The entire community was being treated the same as the school. That must have been confusing for parents, number one, to have, you know, to have to, to endure that. What were some of the biggest challenges? I know you've already spoken a little bit about parents, but what were some of the other biggest challenges in dealing with um, how to encourage parents to come back and how to help the community see what you could do? Yes, thank you. Uh, some of the biggest challenges was the safety, uh, marketing, making sure the scholars were six feet apart hard, uh, no sharing, no contact, no transitioning. Once they entered the building, the teacher that they were with, they had to remain with, uh, even with lunch, water breaks, uh, just more so. The, the biggest challenges was safety, checking the temperature before they get out the car, uh, even if they rolled the bus, uh, making sure that they were seating, uh, like every other seat, they couldn't sit with anyone unless it was a sibling in the same household. So our biggest challenge was making sure that we made sure all everyone was safe, not only the scholars, but our teachers as well. And then they changed and said it should be three feet. It can be three, it could be three feet, yes. And you can't get it from touch, so... Yes. And it turns out I Just had COVID, I never had a fever. With, uh, the different phases and what was allowed during yeah. phase one, phase right. two, phase three. Uh, you're totally correct. Uh, our school supply list in the beginning of the year, we ordered, usually ordered construction paper, glue, uh, notebooks, but that school supply list was a lot different. We had ordered masks, desk shields, uh, a lot of uh, spray, sanitizer, uh, caution tape. So okay. yeah, just keeping up with the different phases that we're in and the guidelines for each phase. And then before I go to Joanne, did, have you had more demand for your school from the community? Have there been more people wanting to, how do we get to your school? How do we enroll? Have you oh, had yes. oh yes, because they saw what was offered during the virtual time uh, compared to what was going on at other schools. One thing about GEO, we never stop teaching. Uh, it may not have been perfect because our teachers weren't uh, trained in the virtual setting, but they did the best that they could with what they could do, with what they knew. Uh, so our, our waiting lists have increased uh, because a lot of the pairs, there's a lot of schools and the pairs, they went more so asynchronous and then they went hybrid, but we never did hybrid. 
Uh, we either did those kids that was virtual or we did face-to-face -face every day. I was at one day we shut down for like a deep cleaning. So with just what, how we dealt with the pandemic and the parents realizing what we did versus what other schools did increased our waiting list. Yeah, and I'm and I'm hearing that more and more um, schools that have the flexibility and autonomy, which do yeah. tend to be charter schools, um, not always exclusively, um, actually did more face to face. Whereas there were constraints on by contract and otherwise traditional public schools that had to limit their time that they demanded the teachers do this. Um, what was your experience, Joanne? Yeah, so we are, our our return was really dictated more by the state, and and quite honestly, there's some litigation around that right now because just co conflict with what statute says and what was done. That's a different story altogether. So we did not have any more autonomy than the public schools did. Quite honestly, right. um, it was optional for it became optional on September 8th for schools to come back, and across the entire state, very few. I mean, we were one of only dozen schools that returned in the entire state, <laughs> you know, so, but, but we opted to, and it, again, was, it was demand, like our families, we asked, what do you want? That's what they wanted. But, you know, I, I, we, we increased our enrollment by 30%. We had the number one enrollment for an in, for a regular school. The only two schools in the state that beat us in enrollment increases were two virtual schools that are fully virtual anyhow. And so it, it says a lot that the demand continued. And I think that as families recognize that this is a school that was providing in person because it, it didn't work online for everybody, you know. And so that really um, that, that was significant for us. You know, going back to your initial question that you had asked, like, um, absolutely, I would say that if we had more autonomy, absolutely, we could have done it. We did it despite having to jump a thousand hurdles to make this happen. I mean, we continued to serve meals to families, both in person and remote. We still offered breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We still offered a before school program and after school program. Uh, we, we did weekend meal distributions. I mean, we continued all those things. We just had to work a lot harder to do it and, and work within the parameters. I think that the autonomy for us where, you know, we ran into some challenges is we were actually challenged on, well, we don't like how you're doing it because, you know, it needs to look this way. So there were a few things we ran into and we continue to just jump the hurdles, you know, and it was one of those things. I'll tell you, there were days that I went home that I would think sometimes like, maybe I should just throw in the towel and like, just go remote like the rest of the, cause this is like, it's, it, it's taxing, you know, it wasn't about working hard. I had no problem working hard, but it, when it changes, not, I can deal with the change, but it was, it was feeling like you were shackled where you couldn't really like make the decisions and stuff. And you were told how you had to do it. That was probably the greatest challenge. The safety stuff. I, we did it. We navigated. I think the challenge was really having to constantly have the moving target and then always having to meet somebody else's criteria. And I'm not talking six feet. We have no problem with that. It was the other right. stuff that was moving that made it challenging, but we did it. And and don't you think all three of you, don't you think at the end of the day, the point that Joanne made is it was up to your families, right? right. The families should have the power to say, I want my child in school. And then the second part of that is this, this rush of let's get back to normal. That means everybody sitting in a chair and being lectured to. I, there were some students who thrived in a virtual setting, right? And and let them do that. And if you want to go back, go back. If you want to have more of a virtual setting, then let's go. Amen. Um, you know, could I, could all of you quickly comment on that? And I know we're very short on time, but if you could give me ten seconds on that aspect, that would be great. So, uh, so my my ten seconds on that is yes. Absolutely. You know, I think when we first shut down, we literally immediately when we got the notice and it all went out, we scheduled Zoom meetings with almost 2000 families within 48 hours because we knew we needed to talk to them and hear them and alleviate the concerns. And then, I mean, we I can't tell you how many meetings we had mass meetings, working nights to get communication out and to get communication in. What do you need? How can we support you? We surveyed them. The minute schools shut, we did parent conferences two weeks later virtually. We didn't cancel them and we, we solicited. So that was one of, I think our key successes was listening to families and being incredibly responsive to what they needed. There's, there's no one size fits all solutions in this. I think that school-based decision-making is best when it comes to programming and responding to family need. 
I do think, as I said, on health safety, we need consistency. And I think if we could all be held accountable to safe, you know, the safety protocols, absolutely. But give us all the resources we need to meet our, the needs of our students and families. And that I think would allow us to get back sooner, to serve families well, and to continue to be innovative. Sherlon? Yes, uh, with that being said, I totally agree. There is no one size fits all to it. Our key successes during this whole pandemic was that we were able to, uh, basically we had autonomy to do what we needed to do within our charter, uh, but still adhering to the uh, only safety guidelines. Like we were able to uh, provide uh, uh, additional uh, professional development for the uh, teachers and whatever we needed to do. Uh, like Joanne said, virtual Zoom meetings, we, we did it. Uh, we didn't have to go through a long chain of command to get approval for things that we needed resources. Uh, I agree with uh, Michelle and here, uh, in the Chromebooks, we were ordered, we ordered them. So what I, basically whatever we needed, uh, we, we received it. And while education yeah. continued, uh, we still get called into question as to how and why we do things the way we as charter schools do them. Thank you so much. Jeannie Allen, you want to take it away to say thank you and then move to panel three? I will. Thank you, Joanne, Meshe, and Shalon. Um, Against All Odds, Brick and Martyr Schools Open for Learning. We felt that was very, very important to highlight um, your work. And as we uh, transition to the next uh, group, Happy Charter Schools Week, and thanks for being with us. Um, and you can reach them all through our uh, Twitter feed and, um, and Facebook and through our website.